y'all for coming. Appreciate it. We get on Gary Shell. Thank y'all for coming tonight to the presentation on Vicksburg. How many of y'all ever been to Vicksburg? And seen the battlefield? It's a humongous thing. I mean, it's just 29 miles of road to drive on and all these monuments to look at. The reason I became interested in Vicksburg is because my ancestors were there. And he was uh, with the 31st Missouri Infantry. And Vicksburg is, was uh, probably one of the, to me, the key battle on the Mississippi River. Before I go too much farther, I have a song for your listening pleasure. It's a song by Bobby Horton. Here we go. presidents in the United States that started the Civil War. Vicksburg actually started, the siege of Vicksburg started on May 18, 1863, and we had two presidents at the time in the United States. One president was President Abraham Lincoln, and this is what he said. He said, see what a lot of land these fellows hold, of which Vicksburg is the key. The war can never be brought to a close until the key is in our pocket. We can take all the ports of the Confederacy and they can defy us if they still possess Vicksburg. President Jefferson Davis, who was the president for the Confederacy, who owned a farm about 30, I believe it was a little bit less than 30 miles south of Vicksburg, or a plantation, I guess not a farm, said Vicksburg is a nail head that holds the South's two halves together. And so the Mississippi was the major source of food stuff, anything, because the United States could not blockade Mexico. So a lot of the material that the South was getting to, that were sending to their army in Mississippi, 
and in Louisiana was coming by way of Mexico because the United States could not blockade, it could not invade into Mexico waters. And so a lot of stuff would come across the river at the Mississippi River. Now, this was kind of the key to me. This is a wartime picture of Vicksburg. You'll see right there that it's kind of the courthouse in Vicksburg. But this is not the view that the Army had. This is more the view that the Navy had. The Navy had the, the U.S. Navy under Admiral Ford had ships off in the Mississippi River where they were shelling the town of Vicksburg. The Army at Vicksburg. The Federal Army was commanded by Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton. Does anybody know anything unique about General Pemberton? General Pemberton was from Pennsylvania. So he was a Union-born Confederate general in charge of the Army around Vicksburg. The Confederate Army had approximately 34,000 troops during the siege. There was 13 states that were represented at the Battle of Vicksburg. They had troops from South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi. Every state in the Confederacy had at least one regiment represented at the Battle of Vicksburg. There was 15 Missouri Confederate regiments at the Battle of Vicksburg. 20 men from San Genevieve fought at the Battle of Vicksburg. The Union Army was underneath Major General Ulysses S. Green. Now, beyond my Wallace Hulse and Green, but we've never been able to prove that Ulysses S. Grant was ever set foot in St. Genevieve. But he had, at, by the end of the siege, he had 75,000 men. At the start of the siege, he had around 66,000 men, but he kept saying, send me more, send me more. 18 states in the Union were represented. I mean, state, states like New Hampshire, Vermont, West Virginia. It just always amazed me that, you know, how did these guys end up over here in Mississippi? But they were there. 27 Missouri Union regiments fought at Vicksburg. 13, I should be 11, I'm supposed to change it up. Yeah, but 11 men fought from San Genevieve, who were from San Genevieve, fought at the Battle of Vicksburg. Here's the names of the 11 Union soldiers from San Genevieve. We have George Beckerman, who was in Company F, 30th Missouri. George W. Dodge, who was in Company B, 31st Missouri. Sergeant George W. Falk, who was killed. It's kind of a controversy about exactly when he was killed. But he was, he was listed as being killed at the Battle of Vicksburg on May 23rd. Then we have James Artificer, James Hammer, who was in Battery 8 of 1st Missouri Light Artillery. Uh, Norbert Kemp. Christian Lutfield, who was 1st Sergeant. Henry Roseman, who was a private in the 30th Illinois. We have Frederick, Private Frederick Sturgis in the 1st Missouri Light Artillery. Private James Ball in Company 830th Illinois. Joseph Gorst who was a lieutenant in the 12th Missouri Infantry, and Jacob Ely, who was a private in Missouri Light Artillery. I don't know if you're going to tell it later, but George Beckerman and uh, Henry Rosen became head of the GAR here. Right yeah, on. I was going to tell okay, you. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Do you all hear that? We have, we used to have a Grand Army Republic post here in St. Denis, and uh, these two here, George Beckerman and Henry Roseman became commanders, and George Falk, brother, became commander. This is a picture of the Union works at Vicksburg, pretty much after the battle. But you'll see right here, you know what these things are called? Is it faster? It's, uh, yeah, they're called sap rollers. What they would do is they would make these and, and there's two sets of sap rollers, pretty much one on this side, one right there, and the trench was dug down. The sap rollers were, if, if you all look up here, I think I have a picture, anyway, there's a picture on one of these pages on these magazines up here where they're making the sap rollers. And what they would do is they would make a basket, like Bob said, 
and they would fill the basket up with reeds or little limbs and stuff, and they would call sap rollers because a lot of times they were freshly cut, so they were still leaking sap, but they would roll and they would use these to hide behind to build their trenches and stuff. And so they, they would roll them kind of like, a, we all know in Missouri, the hemp bale battle up in Lexington, it's the same concept. They would roll these sap rollers in front of them, and then they would put them up here, and then they would start filling them anything they could with dirt. A lot of times, but these would basically would be amazing how many mini balls this, something like this would stop. But these were, the Union Works was pretty much how do you say this? A work of art, almost. The, the works at Vicksburg were studied by countries like France and Germany. And a lot of people say that the trenches that were used during World War I, where they learned how to do this when they first started the World War I, was from the works, the studies that they did of the works at Vicksburg. Now this is a picture I took, and I think it had to be around 1994, something like that. And this guy's not, right? he never served in the Civil War, but he's actually a, a federal employee cutting grass. Uh, but this is called zigzag trenches, okay? They could not build a trench, you know, they, would, could, they didn't build a trench and then run forward and build another trench. In order to approach the, the redons and the fortifications around Vicksburg, the Union soldiers built the trenches like this. One thing I read uh, in a book one time, this guy said that he would go to, they would fire all day, he'd go to sleep at night. Soldiers and engineers would build trenches during the night. And he said when he got up in the morning, he'd look, it was like a whole new line. It was just, Amazed how much work they did during the night. This is a good example of what the Union troops did. Is they called it a zigzag trench. This is a map of the assault of Vicksburg. General Grant, when after the Battle of Champion Hill, the Big Black River, Jackson, the Confederacy ran into the through the works, and that were already prepared and set up their defensive line. General Grant did not want a siege. So they, the Confederate Army retreated to Vicksburg and arrived there on May 18, 1863. General Grant's troops arrived there and it just seems like General Grant wanted to attack them. He says, let's, they're demor demoralized, let's get them while they're beat, you know, and they'll surrender if we show a support. So he took General Sherman's 15th Army Corps, General McPherson's 17th Army Corps, and ordered them to attack. General Grant ordered this attack on the, primarily on the Stockade Redoubt, which is right here, which was occupied by the 27th Louisiana. Now the troops from St. Genevieve, like the 30th Missouri, the 31st Missouri, which we have several in the 30th Missouri, they were underneath Colonel Manter's command. You notice there's a little stream or a little creek right here? Well, this was a ridge that the Union occupied. This is a ridge that the Confederates had their works on. So Manter's men, or men from the 30th Missouri and the ones we have in the 31st Missouri, attacked from here. And attacked from, but they weren't the major attack. Their whole goal was to attack here and keep these troops occupied while the main thrust was through this redound. Does anybody know what the word redound means? Or, I'm not even sure I'm saying it right. It's spelled R-E-D-A-N. Well, I didn't know either. It basically means the arrowhead shape. It sticks out past the main lines and was supported by troops on either side. But the troops inside the redound, stockade redound, which later became better known as the 27th Louisiana, was the 27th so you had people coming in from McPherson's army and some of General Sherman's army attacking. The artillery that was on, on these ridges on, occupied by the Union, they were firing at the same time. 
General Pemberton had sent a report to General Johnston during the battle, and he said, we've had 800 guns fire at us almost nonstop, day and night. And that's counting the, the river boats. And then there was even some mortar set over here on this DeSoto, Pennsylvania Peninsula that were firing into the city. The Union suffered in this assault 157 killed, 777 wounded, and eight missing for a total of 942. The best records we have of the Confederates was eight killed and 62 wounded, 70 casualties. And that's the thing there is about attacking a fortification. You know that you're going to lose at least three times as many as the enemy is. This is way more than three times as many. So that's how strong these works were. So a couple of days later, General Grant, still not wanting to go into a siege, decided it was time to try again. So what he did was he decided instead of having just a small attack on one primary location, there were going to be major attacks all the way across the line. You still have General Sherman up here. Here's Manter again. This is uh, where the 30th, members of the 30th Missouri that were from San Genevieve fought in. And a couple of them were in, in Colonel Woods's, Charles Woods's uh, brigade. Then you had McPherson's. You remember the previous one, McPherson was more up here. Well, he had slid around down here more. But again, they attacked the Stockade Redown, or the Louisiana. But then there, you see the strong attack here. Then down here, you have McPherson attacking. And then you have McLaren. And I'm going to cover the 6th Missouri Confederate Infantry, which several, 11 of the men of the Confederacy served in the 6th Missouri Infantry during the Battle of Vicksburg. They were in General Bowen's, John S. Bowen's division. General Bowen's division was in reserve. In other words, he was sitting here. He had Colonel Cockrell up here, who's one of his uh, brigade commanders. And Cockrell, the 6th Missouri, was in, in Colonel Cockrell's uh, brigade. But they sent, here's where the 6th Missouri was fighting. Up in here was some of the other rest of the Missouri units Confederate, like the 5th and the 3rd and the 4th. But wherever they needed to be, Colonel Cockrell, had, had wrote, in one of his official reports, said, Sir, please restrict somebody calling for my men, because my men, and you got to realize by this time the siege that's going on, they were on starvation rations. They were, even at day uh, 12, which was probably around, around uh, June 1st, General Pemberton wrote General Johnston and said, I only have about 20 days worth of rations if I spread it out. But later on, the concern by Colonel Cockrell that his men going a mile, mile and a half to go reinforce somebody down here instead of being up in this here area where they're supposed to be, he says it's too hard on them because they're getting weaker and weaker. And, you know, it takes them 20 minutes to get there. You know, and he said, and they go at the run, he said, they're just not strong enough in order to do what you're really wanting them to do. But again, Union casualties, 502 killed, just in this one assault. And then here's where, how many of you have ever heard of the, a group called the Forlorn? The Forlorn Hope was they asked for 177 volunteers. They didn't tell them what they were going to do, they just asked for 177 volunteers. So all these 177 volunteers, they volunteered. They said, okay, here's what you're going to, here's what you volunteered. You have number one, you have to be single. And it's better if you don't have any family. So they finally got it down to 177 guys. Well, right then they know it doesn't look too promising. <laughs> what they did was they were going to take ladders. Some of them were going to carry ladders. Some were going to carry boards. And then once carrying the ladders, they're going to throw the ladders down over the entrenchments. And the ones carrying boards were going to carry the, throw the boards over the ladders so the troops behind them could rush and go into the Sudan. So they call it the forlorn hope because these guys knew they didn't have a chance in the world. But they did do it. And surprisingly enough, the 
around 66 of them survived. So pretty much all the survivors in the 1890s, they were all issued the, the Medal of Honor. They received the Medal of Honor for volunteering to do this. And it's kind of surprising if you go back and you look at the Missouri, not Missouri, but the Medal of Honor recipients, and you go back to the Civil War era, there were several from Missouri. But, and, most, and it's just amazing to me that these guys volunteered and once they said, once you volunteered, there was no back now. But that's what, that's how desperate they were to do this. Well, 502 were killed, 2,550 were wounded, and 147 were missing for a total casualty count of 3,199. That's just on the Union side. The Confederates have an estimated casualties of 500 killed, wounded, and missing. So again, if the Union lost more in killed than the Confederates lost overall. But again, the Unions were attacking all the way around here. Now, General McClellan, and his name is John, I can't, General, General John McClellan was from Illinois. He's one of these political generals. Matter of fact, he was actually, I believe, a state senator from Illinois. He got command of this bunch of men who he wasn't supposed to get, but it was President Lincoln the presidential appointment. General Grant, General Sherman never did like him because number one, he was a political general, never went to West Point. And so during this battle, General McClellan sent General Grant a note and said, rush up here, send me more men because I have troops that have occupied, have broke the Confederate line in two spots. Send me troops and, and take advantage of this. General Grant said, I don't believe him. But General Grant was, <laughs> was up here on the high grounds in some area, and I never did figure out where he was. But he was observing the battle. He says, I don't see it. General Sherman was there, so I figured he was up here in General Sherman's area. But General Sherman was sitting there. General Sherman said, well, at least go look. You know, at least go look. And General Grant said, no, I just don't believe him. General Sherman said, well, the least you could do is go look, just to prove him wrong. So General Grant said, OK. So they rode down there, and by the time they got down there, you know, they had lost the opportunity. And so General McLaren later on in, in June, I believe, in 1863, later in the month, said, sent out a letter to his troops saying, thank you for your great and, and, and noble duty during this battle on May 22nd. And because of this, I will win Vicksburg. And General Grant took it personal and relieved him that day because he figured General McLaren was right there to start looking to say, I'm going to get presidential aspirations. But this is the second day. After this day, they pretty much settled into a siege. And this is the siege line. The Confederates and the Union were up here on the ridges. General Sherman still up here. By this time, Colonel Mantor's uh, brigade is over here right at, in right around in this area, they can see the river. Some people call that Fort Hill in this area. The siege became one of, you know, pretty much just out waiting, waiting till the Confederates surrendered, pretty much what it was. But they just didn't sit there. The Union troops were always, go back to the zigzag trench, they were always trying to get closer, get their line closer and closer. They were always sharpshooting. If you go to Vicksburg right now and go up here on the Union line, where the sharpshooter line they call it, they were sharpshooting at the Confederates. The Confederates poked their head up, they shoot them. Same thing with the Confederates. So the Confederates were sharpshooting the guys in the trenches. But the Confederates were losing men day and night. Just, they were taking casualties, it was terrible. Not only from rifle fire, but also from these cannons. You see here, by June 14th, Grant had received enough reinforcements where he was around 71,000 men. He had 248 pieces of artillery, 248 guns, plus all the guns on the boat. And I'm not sure. I got the 800 guns from General Pemberton's report, so he might have over-exaggerated it a little bit. But the thing, the problem with the Confederates was they were expending ammunition that they couldn't replace. General Grant 
was expending ammunition that he didn't have any problem replacing. So General Grant was in this position, had him where the Confederates couldn't get out. Then, about this time in the middle of June, General Johnston had arrived at Jackson, Mississippi, which was the capital of Mississippi. And he arrived with around 8,000 men because the Confederate uh, uh, president told him to go and relieve the pressure on General Pemberton's men so they can, these men can be evacuated because men were a more valuable resource to the Confederacy than holding the city. That was General Johnston about him. But President Davis says, no, we're holding Vicksburg. I want you to go in there and relieve the pressure on General Pemberton where he can at least get some of his men out and cause the city to stay in the Confederacy. But like most politicians, they were on the field, they had no idea. General Pemberton sent General Johnston a note and says, how many men do you have? General Johnston said, I have around 8,000 men with me that came with me. Then he got General Loring's command, which was actually part of General Pemberton's command that got separated at the Battle of the Big Black River in Champion Hill. So they had around 14,000 men. All in total, by the time General Johnson was ready to relieve the pressure on General Pemberton, he had around 32,000 men. To get back to the battle and the siege, the 6th Missouri Infantry Confederate, like I said, during the battle we had 11 men who served in, from San Genevieve, who served in the battle of Vicksburg. Five of the men who served in the various Missouri artillery units originally enlisted into the 6th Missouri Infantry underneath the assumption that when they enlisted into Company I, Company I was going to be an artillery unit. But Company I did not get enough men or enough equipment in order to have a good artillery unit. So they all pretty much enlisted into the infantry except for around five of them who later enlisted into this artillery. Like Guy Bars, you'll see here you have John F. Abishire. You know, he was captured at Vicksburg. He was sent to the prison at Gratuary Prison. Then he was sent to a, a prisoner of war camp in Indiana. And then he was sent back to the Provost Marshal because he decided to sign the oath of, oath of of allegiance to the United States, a loyalty oath, as they called it. But then somebody had to post bond. Well, the person who posted bond was John Abshire from St. Genevieve, and the bond usually at that time of the war was around a thousand dollars. Now, Private Edmund Beard was captured at Vicksburg, but he died at Grand Fork Prison in July of 1863. Alexander Harris died of his wounds at Demopolis, Alabama. When they surrendered, when General Pemberton eventually surrendered, the men were pardoned. They had to sign a pardon. They had to sign, basically sign the oath of allegiance to be pardoned. They were promised that if you did that by the Confederate General, if you did that, if you signed this oath of allegiance, that you will be pardoned. But then, you can fight again. So that's what most of the men did. They signed this with the idea of like, I am not ever going to not fight for the Confederacy. Private Charles Howard, who was captured at Ch Champion Hill, which was right before the Battle of Vicksburg. Eli Labriere, who was wounded in the right hill, right thigh at Champion Hill. He also surrendered, so he survived in the room. Corporal Adrian La Lamadier, who was captured at Vicksburg. Corporal John Lethwich, who was wounded at Vicksburg, said his left leg was shot off. Then they amputated his leg off at Defy. Musician Edward Seisler surrendered at Vicksburg. Then the, that's just all Company I. Then Company D, Augustus LaRose was wounded at Vicksburg. Private Augustin Leon Tomer was captured at Vicksburg. And Private Joseph J. Winston was captured at Vicksburg, but on the way to Demopolis, he deserted. Augustin Leon Tomir was a <coughs> member of the Company D, 6th Missouri Infantry. He was 
most of the times it said in his records it just says Leon. So he's known more as Leon. Um, now, he had a brother named Felix. Him and his brother served on the uh, CSS Arkansas, which was a gunboat. In September of 1862, it was sunk by the Union Navy. But his brother Felix died there, but he survived. And if, correct me if I'm wrong. What happened to Leon Thomas? He moved to St. Denis. He returned to St. Denis after the war. He was the one that was killed by the Union sympathizers when he got home. If you read this, read this book by Bob Schmidt, I can't remember the name of it exactly, but he talks about the letters of, of uh, Boys from the Best Family. Say again? Called Boys from the Best Family. Yeah, it's got it's got uh, letters in it from uh, Alexander Chadwell. <coughs> Alexander's dad, Gideon, says, "Don't come home because they're killing returning letters." And the ones he was referring to was this Augustine Leon Thomas, who's buried in a memorial cemetery. Now the thing of it is, Alexander Chadwell spent eight years in Nashville, Tennessee, and then once his father got sick, he returned back to Nashville. Returned back to St. Genevieve. So even though the war was over, the war wasn't over in Missouri. These are the names of the ones who served from St. Genevieve. We have 20 of them from the front of Confederates. Some of them are already talked about. We have men in our light artillery, 3rd Missouri Cavalry, Landis Light Artillery. You have keyboards, battery, like this Xavier Labriere, he was actually one of the ones that initially enlisted into the Company I, 6th Missouri Infantry. You have Wade's Battery. Here's another, that's John Lethwich. Uh, I'm a, I don't know any different, but I, I'm assuming that he survived, you know. But these are the names, 20 names from St. Genevieve that served in the Confederacy at the Battle of Vicksburg. Some of these guys were later killed at places like Atlanta, Alatoona Pass, uh, Franklin, Tennessee, you know. So they all did, most of them did rejoin. Well, this is a drawing of the crater of the third Louisiana Reno. All right. Again, you notice it's kind of like it sticks out. This here is a, actually a betrayer of the crater fight. This is supposed to be the Union line. This is the Confederate line up here, so this is the Redon. This is the crater. The crater was blown up by 2,000 pounds of gunpowder that the Union troops mined underneath the Redon, and they blew it up 2,000 pounds. There, there's a report of uh, uh, the same thing happening at the Stockade Redon, where it, they blew it up. And it's just like they said, soldiers in this one, at that stockade were down manned by uh, some of the 6th Missouri Infantry. And they said it just blew them up in the air. Some of them got buried alive. But the crater was so big, it doesn't look that big here. But the Union troops rushed in there. And it's kind of like the, you always hear about the crater of Petersburg, you know, the crater fight at Petersburg, Virginia. But they had like three of these at Two of them they blew up. The third one they were getting ready to blow up, but then that's about the time that Pemberton surrendered. But this trench here, I would say is not too accurate, you know. But these trenches here, you can see there's, these guys here are standing behind those uh, sap rollers. There's a trench. So they're firing from up here, and they're down here. And then here's the Confederates up here firing down at This is the view from the stockade redone, which is on the graveyard road. This here is the Union, Union skirmish line. That's how far they away they were from the stockade redone. They were firing from there to stock, and that's not no short distance. You know, you figure if this road is what, basically maybe 16 feet wide at the most. That's 16 feet. Just imagine how far a distance that was. The, the mine they were digging for this stockade 
was back underneath this area. So they would dig here and dig underneath there and then come up underneath here down and blow it up. Colonel Francis M. Cockrell's brigade, which was Confederate, here's his total casualties for the siege of Vicksburg. And if you notice, 6th Missouri Infantry suffered the most casualties. By far, of over 60 men total casualties. They had the most, you know, so they were very active in this, in this thing. And as the siege went on and on, this lets you know the type of arms and ammunition. If you look at some of this stuff, one thing that, that uh, uh, General Pemberton kept asking Johnson for was caps. I need musket caps. Well, here's the count of musket caps. And this was taken prior to the, the battle, from what I read. They had 93,740 musket caps. But look at the type of weapon they had. This here is a 69 caliber percussion lock musket. Mississippi rifles were 54 caliber. The 69, and I don't know this for sure, but the British muskets that were 75 and the Belgian muskets that were 70, I'm thinking they're smooth bullets. Where the mini muskets were 58 caliber and the infield rifles were rifled. But look at the ammunition, the mini ball ones. Buck and ball. Buck and ball is, is a terrible. You really don't want to shoot that out of a rifle bullet anyway because it has two little small bullets and one big bullet. And it's called buck and ball. That's why it's called buck and ball. They did a lot of damage when they fired it out. Total casualties for the Union at Vicksburg were 806 killed, 3,904 wounded, 164 missing and captured, for a total casualty of 4,910. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge. Confederate casualties were 805 killed, 1,938 wounded, 29,620 missing and captured, which included everybody that was captured at Vicksburg, for a total of 32,492. The whole thing of it is, how many were killed in the Union Army at the battle that won, won battle was May 22nd? Anybody remember? It was around 506, 502, something in that area. Cas the Union casualties killed were mostly done in their two major attacks on the three down. Confederate lost 805 killed. Most of their kills was from in the entrenchments and the blowing up of the redons and the mines that blew up and fighting in the entrenchments all the time. Because as Colonel Cockrell said that he was losing men, many men every day just from being shot, wounded and killed. This is a picture of after the battle or after the siege of the Confederate city of Vicksburg. Okay? You notice this was the entryway. The people in town lived in these caves. They dug these caves inside the hill. They lived in these caves. That was their only protection. Because even though the artillery was firing at the better troops in the trenches and the and the, the river boats were firing at the Union trenches, they were still people the people in town were still being killed by shells. Because a lot of times, even though artillery is fairly accurate, when you start shooting it at night, which they did, you never know where they're going. So the only place for safety for the Confederates, these were the entrances to the caves. And you see they had the top cover. But the caves had a narrow, once you got inside the cave, it was very narrow, and then it spread out. And they lived in these caves for 47 days because this was their best source of protection to keep from being killed. Because it got so bad during the siege, 
that they were eating horse meat. Like if a horse died or got killed by artillery, if like during the night in the morning when these civilians or even soldiers would wake up and see like a dead horse laying there, they would run out there and start taking the meat off of it to eat. That was one of their sources of food. The only source of water they had, because of all this death and stuff, a lot of the sources of natural water that they had became bad. They started collecting rainwater. That was one of their sources of water. You know that old saying, like, like being out in the middle of the ocean, water everywhere, but you know, not a drop to drink. It was the same way in Vicksburg. They had all this water in the Mississippi River that they couldn't get to because of the Confederates watching. Now, to get back to the crater. At this time, around June 14th, to get back to work, General Grant found out that General Johnston was to his rear. He had around 30,000 men by this time. He became very concerned. So what he did is he split his forces in half. And this, this uh, Henry Roseman, who was in the 30th Illinois, who was a musician, he was in the band. He was part of General Sherman's army that went to the Black River and was waiting to set up, they set up defensive positions in order to guard against General Johnston coming in and attacking from the rear. So General Grant was fighting a battle on two fronts. General Johnston, if you know anything about General Johnston, he was a very good general. He was not very aggressive, but if he saw an opportunity, he was probably one of the better generals at least in my opinion. But he was also very concerned about his men. His men loved him because he would not waste the lives of his men. But he never saw an opportunity in order to go to relieve General Pemberton. So here we have around, by this time, around 20,000 men inside of, of Vicksburg, which had been under siege and starving and skinny and sick General John S. Bowen, who was commander of the division which Cockrell's uh, Missouri Brigade was in, he died on July 13th of dysentery. So it now it only affected the men, it affected the officers. They all were suffering from disease. This is the battle flag, national colors of the 29th Missouri Infantry. They were at they were in uh, in uh, Colonel Banker's brigade. This is an example. This flag was six foot by six foot, almost a, almost a perfect square. Most national colors, most flags back then were tied down. They did, you know, some flags had holes in them, for, you know, but most flags tied. This is the flag of the Seventh Missouri Regiment. They were the ones that fought at the stock Avery Down as far as, as well as did the 12th Missouri. They suffered numerous casualties. Over half their regiment was either wounded or killed at the, in this charge on the stock Avery Down. But you notice the names on their, on their flag. Corner, Mississippi. Port Gibson, which is on the Mississippi. Raymond, Mississippi, which was one of the battles prior to the siege. Jackson, Mississippi, which was one of the battles just prior to the siege. Champion Hills, Vicksburg, May 22nd, they were on this one. And then the siege of Vicksburg. This is the other side of their flag, and it says Veterans, 1864. In 1864, when most of these regiments, like the 7th Missouri, that had enlisted in 1861, their three years were up. And in order for them to, the United States Army to try and keep these men because they were well seasoned veterans. They said, if you become a veteran regiment, we will give you 30 days to leave. You can go home, come back in 30 days, and just pick up where you left off. And this was in January of 1864. And you will be able to display the word veteran on your flight. And a lot of regiments did. It wasn't just Missouri. It was every every regiment in the in the in the U.S. Army, in the Federal Army, that had been listed in 1861 had this on. This is the Sixth Missouri Infantry Regiment flag. Like this is 
at the Shiloh National Park. It has the 13 stars on it. This is the Missouri Monument. We have a member here, and a member of our camp here, Scott Reed, who took this bit of But this monument is placed upon the stockade we got. This monument has both sides. This is the only monument in Pittsburgh that represents both sides. This side here represents the Confederate. This side here represents the United States forces. The Missouri Monument, you can read it for yourself. It's on the stockade we done. That's where my regiments in Missouri from the south, the regiments in Missouri from the north met. They fought against each other. So it was kind of like brother against brother. I've got this print somewhere. And I was telling Bob about it, but I couldn't find it. I think it's out of storage or something. But there's a, a Harper's Weekly, which I have a couple examples of Harper's Weekly up here. You can come up and look at it afterward, where they have a drawing of the 6th Missouri Confederate and the 6th Missouri Union, two brothers, one in each regiment. We met across in the middle, in between the lines, and we're discussing problems at home. You know, have you heard from mom? And I've written it to the guy, yeah, she's doing good. Because the Confederates, you know, like, if you were living in St. Denis, then you want to write your son in the 6th Missouri Infantry Confederate. There was, you couldn't send them a letter legally because then you were conspiring with the enemy. And by conspiring with the enemy, you were therefore subject to being arrested and sent to graduate prison. Mm. But the monument is 42 feet high, which represents the amount, the total number of regiments that fought at Vicksburg. 27 Union, 15 Confederate. The monument features a bronze angel which represents the spirit of the Republic, which is in the middle. And it was sculptured and erected for $40,000 and dedicated on October 17, 1917. This monument today, just in the past two weeks, for about the last two years, the Sunday Union Veterans of the Civil War had been trying to get funds to have this monument repaired. It does have some damage, you know, mostly weather related, but there is an interior. So we've been trying, we actually got last year, we got $375,000 in the budget just for this one monument. That's what the National Park Service at Vicksburg says would take to repair it to a really good condition. But the money got locked up somewhere in another department and they said they would, couldn't spend it because it wasn't legal for them to spend it for that. So just recently, within the la this last week, we found out that the National Park Service has found the funds in their budget in order to repair this monument. And the reason they said they actually wanted to repair it is because it is the only monument in all of Vicksburg on the National Park, and they have tons of monuments that represents both men from both sides. This is a close-up of the Confederate side. This is a close-up of the Union side. Total 27 Union, 15 Confederate, approximately 15,000 men from Missouri fought at Vicksburg. This is a book called The Dearest and the Best, written by Gary D. Truman. It's the biography of Private Daniel McKnight. He was a member of the 5th Missouri Infantry. And here he says, Colonel Cocker said he was aware of oh, one man, Daniel Monaghan, shouted he would never surrender, especially not the day he was on, after all, the 4th of July, Independence Day. General Pemberton met with General Grant on <coughs> July 1st. He said, I would like to surrender, return to surrender. General Grant said, unconditional surrender, no terms. General Pemberton said, very well, we'll continue to fight. We're not beaten yet. General Pemberton on July 3rd said, let me talk, let's talk again. General Grant said, okay, here's the terms. I'll give you terms. Officers may keep their sidearms and their, their sabers. The men will surrender all their weapons, all regimental flags, and will march out of the works 
they'll be taken to a spot, and once assigned the parole, they'll be taken to a spot where they'll be turned back over to the Confederacy. So General Pemberton would not surrender his men to go to prisoner of war camps. He said, he told General Johnson, if I can surrender my men and let them be paroled, and keep my men in the Confederate Army, I'll surrender. And he was shooting for July 4th, but he thought he would get better terms. And he did. He got a lot better terms because General Grant was always known for U.S. Grant, unconditional surrender. Here's something else I'd like to read, if you don't mind. So what was left of the regiment on 5th Missouri Infantry of 500 could now march only 200 skinny, ragged, sick men as Grant. But we marched in step with long strides, heads held high, and nary a down, downcast eye. We looked neither to the right nor to the left, but straight ahead past the blue cloaks lining each side of Jackson Road. I heard a Yankee officer quietly respectfully order his men to present arms as he saluted our barefooted and tattered band. After stacking our rifles, Sergeant Walton laid our frayed, perforated Missouri battle flag atop the pile with the reverence of bearing an old friend. After rejoining our remnant of the regiment, we dressed our lines and stood at attention. No voices were heard save for the subdued orders of our officers to unbuck our belts and drop our empty cartridge and cap boxes at our feet. Here's the thing. General Grant ordered no band playing or no triumph marches downtown until after the Confederate officers had dismissed their formations. Here's, here's this uh, Private McKnight again. After the surrender ceremony, Jacob set up tables with stacks of papers. File by file, we shuffled forward, signed paroles, swearing on our honor allegiance to the United States and that we would no longer fight against the Union. We all signed it. It was either that or board a boat for Alton, Illinois prison. As soon as we signed our paroles, the Yankee soldiers really surprised me. They treated us as if we were no longer their enemy. For the first time, we looked each other in the eye without the rage of battle, and I guess Frank to me looked mighty pitiful because some Illinois boys shared rations with us. We tried, we tried to pay them with what tobacco we had, but they would have none of it. The killing was over. They were happy. So were we. For the first time in two months, I slept with a full belly and without fear. <laughs> There's a plaque there with the notes, your brother's fault. Private George Beckerman on the left, Company F, 30th Missouri. He's holding a saber right here. This is musician Henry Roseman from 30th Illinois. This is First Lieutenant Joseph Burr, Forrest, of Company A, 12th Missouri. And that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. That one picture you showed of George Beckerman, pretty interesting. It was kind of taken in front of where the anvil is now. George Beckerman was a big produce farmer at that time. And he used his Civil War saber to make uh, sauerkraut. <laughs> he, would, he, would grow, he would grow his cabbages, and that's what he chopped the sauerkraut with, was his saber. And he would load those, the produce in his wagon that they showed there, and he would drive around St. Genevieve selling his produce. 